The term dynasty is not one that is thrown around loosely in the world of sports. It is not a term for a team that has experienced a great season, but rather one that describes greatness over a prolonged period of time. There are but a few teams in the history of sport that fall into this elite category. One of those teams is the New York Islanders. Four straight years, their names were etched into the most cherished trophy in sports. This is the story of that team. This is the story of the legendary dynasty of the New York Islanders. And welcome to Metro Sports Legends. I'm Fran Healy. When the New York Islanders captured their first of four straight Stanley Cups in 1980, it was only eight short years since the team had first come into existence. The careful planning of general manager Bill Torrey and the leadership of head coach Al Arbor had formed a Stanley Cup champion. It was a team that would capture three more championships before they were done. A team that would go down in history as one of the greatest of all time. The 1972-73 National Hockey League season saw the birth of two expansion franchises. One was the Atlanta Flames. The other came to a desolate, windswept area of Long Island and became the New York Islanders. The new team's owner, Roy Bowe, who already owned the New York Nets of the American Basketball Association, would make a monumental decision on February 15, 1972. It was the day that Bo would hire William Arthur Torrey as the man responsible for building the Islanders franchise. Roy did approach me. He had put a group together, obviously. Uh, he was running the Nets in Long Island. And uh, a good part of the ownership group of the Nets, uh, plus some other um, Long Island people uh, were bankrolling it. And um, I was also approached by the Atlanta group. but. Um, a good friend of mine, Art Rooney, the original owner of the Steelers, told me, he said, New York's always the place to go, Bill. You don't have to worry about selling tickets in New York. You just have to worry about putting a good team on the ice. So I kind of followed that. That first edition of the New York Islanders turned out to be a far cry from the champions that they would one day become. That team was so bad, it was, uh, on a, on a ge geological scale, they were subterranean. I mean, they were... Uh, Torrey had a great line. He said, we really want the New York Islanders. New York really wasn't the name. I got to think the team's name was Hapless, as in every story you read was the Hapless Islanders. The New York Islanders lost a record 60 games in that first season, yet Bill Torrey made many outstanding decisions in the formative years of the Islanders' dynasty, one of which was his choice for a coach to take over in the team's second season, Al Arbor. However, getting Arbor and his wife Claire to New York would take some doing. They thought Long Island was like Manhattan, you know, downtown New York, and 
and uh, it was a little scary for them with four young children and, and just the thought of uh, New York kind of scared, I think, Claire more than Al. We happened to be on a, a short vacation in Fort Lauderdale and, and walking the beach and met a couple from, from Long Island and one thing led to another and they just were so descriptive and just so happy and just loved Long Island and uh, so I turned to my husband and I said, well maybe we shouldn't shut that door why don't you go see, And which he did. Uh, Mr. Torrey kept inviting us anyways. So he proceeded to go. I stayed with the kids in St. Louis and he went uh, to visit. And His first remark was, Claire, you can't believe it. You don't see houses for trees. You know, and he loves trees, so he thought Long Island was beautiful. So I said, well, maybe we'll give it a try, which we did. With Arbor in the fold, Torrey continued the work of giving his new coach the players he would need. The two worked together in forming the type of team they wanted, preaching patience along the way. Anybody that was in the business knew that the, the, there were the next two or three years there was a lot of extremely gifted young players coming. Being at the bottom of the, probably the chances of being at the bottom, we were going to be picking first or second or very, very close to the top so that uh, we had a chance to stock ourselves with a lot of good young talent if we had the patience to take that route. Bill Torrey had a game plan, and, and his game plan was similar to uh, uh, Sam Pollock, the great general manager of the Montreal Canadiens, and, and it was to build through the draft. And Bill Torrey, knowing that his team was not going to finish anywhere but last or almost last for the next five years or so, was going to get the premier draft picks. And he wanted to build the team with those draft picks in mind. And in so doing, he stayed the course. And he picked up Billy Harris the first year, and then Dennis Potvin the second year, and then he then uh, Clark Gillies and Brian Trache and then Mike Bossy and these and that was the nucleus of the team of the future. Bill and I seem to be in the same wavelength, in the same page and we worked very well together uh, and as to build something from scratch uh, that was the interesting part of it and setting the stage how how what kind of team are going to have what, uh, what was demanded what's going to be demanded of them and, and to build a, a club from scratch I thought it was a great challenge and I enjoyed it tremendously. The expansion Islanders were still a struggling franchise, yet the seeds were being planted for a future champion. And then uh, the figure of Al comes out of the coaching room with his sweatsuit on and a whistle. And for the next hour, it was just me, Al, and that whistle. Metro Sports Legends is brought to you by Nissan. The best I ever had. What makes the new 255 horsepower Nissan Maxima the envy of all luxury performance sedans? A top 10 engine, eight years running. Voted best in class. 50 safety features. Hey, if you were a luxury performance sedan, you'd be jealous too. And now, get low 3.9 APR for 60 months or 1,000 cash back on a new Maxima. Offers end January 31st. Nissan. Driven. If you want to know what's happening now in New York, then turn on New York Central, weeknights at 11. On the next New York Central, all good foodies go to heaven, plus former Duke Tom Wopat stops by. New York Central, only on Metro TV. Al comes out of the coaching room with his sweatsuit on and a whistle. And for the next hour, it was just me, Al, and that whistle. The team that would one day win four straight Stanley Cup championships would spend the early years on the island trying to simply win over a crowd. A crowd that had known only one NHL hockey team in New York, the New York Rangers. At the beginning, they were uh, embraced as you would embrace a Marx Brothers movie. They were clowns. I mean, there were a lot of laughs. It was like watching Billy Crystal. You know, I mean, uh, they were fun. 
They were fell all over each other. They did stupid things. They lost games this way, that way. And the Rangers were riding high. I mean, when the Islanders came in, the Rangers had won, gone to the finals. They almost won the cup in 72. So this was, uh, this was, these were the sad sacks, but lovable. Well, we played against the Rangers in an exhibition game. And this is in the days where they got the, the short glass. And I come behind our bench. It was our bench in our building. And the row behind me is all, all have Ranger sweaters on. And I'm saying, am I in my building or our building or are we the Ranger building? And through the course of the game, they kept hitting me in the back of the head through the whole course of the game. I says, well, I guess I know what I'm in for now. I remember playing the Rangers the very first time we played the Rangers in our building. And I think Roger Gilbert scored the first goal of the game. And I was, I was really disappointed, you know, to see the fans. I mean, the building erupted just erupted and I thought you know coming from Canada you know our barn is uh, you know sacred it wasn't so sacred in Long Island my first experience of the Rangers the first game we played here at the Coliseum the place was sold out as, as it always is for an Islander Ranger game and uh, the Rangers scored the first goal and the place erupted I couldn't believe it. I'm sitting on the bench I said what the hell is this I said we're playing at the Coliseum the place went crazy he said look around he said there's probably if there's 16,000 people here 13,000 are Ranger fans and it was the case. I mean, there were uh, Ranger fans couldn't get to the garden. They'd buy the tickets at the Coliseum to see the Rangers play. And I said, at that point, I said, you know, that's got to change. They would change. The lean years on the island did not last for long. Torrey would continue to put the pieces in place throughout the 70s. But what would become an impressive collection of hockey talent needed to be harnessed if they were to succeed. Al Arbor turned out to be the perfect man for the job. Al had kind of set the groundwork down at training camp when he took us out for a first day of practice. And normally you just skate around at that time and just, you know, get a feel of your equipment. And we were still out there two and a half hours later. So we kind of got the idea that uh, here's a guy that meant business. He set the standard and that was it. And everybody didn't matter whether it was Dennis Potvin or Mike Bossy or Davey Lewis and, and, and somebody they just brought up from the minors. Everything was the same. He was a very fair man and he never wavered. Al seemed to have the right psych on everybody. Um, he, he seemed to know when to, to yell at a guy uh, at the right time and, and he could only yell at the guy that they would go out there and be mad at him and perform better. He couldn't yell at the guy that was gonna maybe take it heart to heart and, and not perform better. So he had, he had everybody pinned that way. What Al was able to do was he treat each and every fellow on that team as an individual. Um, he treated Wayne Merrick a lot differently than he treated Dennis Poffin. And he treated me a lot differently than he treated Mike Bossy. Uh, so uh, he knew how to push everybody's buttons and uh, and how to get them motivated and how to get them going. We knew if we were playing bad on the ice at uh, one period we're coming in, you know, the crap was going to hit the fan when he came in and he knew how to uh, get us going and, um, you know, he, he loved that guy. Al Arbor had spent his entire life in hockey. As a player, he had been part of a Stanley Cup champion. He understood the dedication that it would take to win and pass that discipline along to the players. A message highly touted rookie Dennis Potvin got loud and clear during his first season on the island. We tried to get to the rink for that 10 o'clock bus and uh, I found out later they left at about 10.06. Uh, that's sort of unheard of today. I think they'd wait for anybody. Um, but I think Al had it in mind that he wanted to make sure and get across that um, you know, I had to start thinking about the team, and I had to start thinking about my responsibilities. And being on time was very much a responsibility Al expected from all of us. Uh, but that was a very difficult day, because uh, I really didn't know what to do. And I didn't get a call till 6 o'clock at night from Philadelphia. And Al said, uh, don't worry about it, stay home, just meet me uh, at the practice tomorrow and be on the ice at 8.30. So I said, fine. Uh, I got to the rink, you know, 7.45, 8 o'clock, nervous. There was nobody around, didn't bother me so much. And then by the time I got a fully dressed, it was about 8.25, there still wasn't anybody in the dressing room. 
And then uh, the figure of Al comes out of the coaching room with his sweatsuit on and a whistle. And for the next hour, practice was at 10 o'clock. Next hour, 8.30, 9.30, it was just me, Al, and that whistle. The turnaround of the Islanders began in earnest in 1975. Just three years after the team's inception, the New York Islanders would take the biggest step yet in their rise to the NHL's elite with their first ever playoff series win. Better yet, the milestone moment came at the expense of the hated New York Rangers in overtime of the third and deciding game at Madison Square Garden. Goes into overtime, just a matter of time before the Rangers you know, get the winning goal, except the Rangers made one mistake, they forgot to get the puck. <laughs> so the Islanders get the puck, throw it in the corner, centering pass, bang, Jay Parisi knocks it in, Brad Park is trying to grab him, and it's behind Jockerman, and the Islander franchise is made. It was the type of thing that you really didn't think you could do it because the Rangers were more established and everything else, but, you know, it's the old saying, give it everything you got, you know, we're in overtime, we're in the city, what more can we ask for? And um, it just happened. And, and I think it started the team thinking, yes, that maybe we could win. The Rangers had a solid hockey club. Uh, I'm glad it wasn't a four out of seven series because we might have been in trouble. But uh, it was the start and then it was the, uh, the, you know, the players got a taste of winning. It's, you know, it's a learning process, learning how to win. And they, they made their first step right there in, in learning how to win. It was very, very important for our club. J.P. Parisi's overtime stunner had put the Islanders on the hockey map. They went on to defeat the Pittsburgh Penguins in the second round, overcoming a three games to none deficit in the process, becoming only the second team in NHL history to accomplish such a feat. They finally succumbed to the eventual Stanley Cup champion Philadelphia Flyers in the semifinal round, but the New York Islanders had arrived. I hated them, yes. You learn to hate them when you play, and uh, I, I've been known to lose my temper, and, uh, and I did. I, I learned to hate them. I hated them, yes. You learn to hate them when you play, and uh, I, I've been known to lose my temper, and... Uh, and I did. I, I learned to hate them. New York had not been home to two NHL teams since 1941 when the Rangers shared the city with the New York Americans. In the mid to late 1970s, the natural rivalry between the upstart New York Islanders and the established New York Rangers would become one of the most bitter in all of sports. Obviously, there was a dislike. I mean, you to, in order to be fired up to play somebody, you, you gotta want to go out there and, and do everything you can to beat them. And, and we used to feel each other's fires. We used, guys used to say certain things, and uh, we'd get on the ice. There was certainly no love lost when we got out there. They were all, all, always putting um, the Stanley Cup in their locker room before they were even getting there, and, and they'd say a lot of things pub publicly in the newspaper that uh, just. Uh, we used to motivate ourselves, and we'd put it on the board, and we'd highlight it, and, and um, it, to me, they were too cocky and not respectful, and, and there's such a fine line there. I hated them, yes. You learn to hate them when you play, and uh, like you said, if they're some of they beat us and you know they had a better team than we did because we we're just starting out and stuff and they start yapping in the paper you you, you get upset at that and uh, I, I've been known to lose my temper and uh, and I did I, I learned to hate them In 1979, a punishing check by Islander defenseman Dennis Potvin fractured the ankle of Ranger winger Ulf Nilsson. 
making Potvin the target of Ranger fans whenever the Isles visited the Garden. It soon became that the, the, the more they said I sucked, the more I wanted to play hard. And, and the more I wanted to hit that Ranger jersey. The Islanders were making a steady climb to the top. By 1978 and 79, many of the key pieces to the Islanders' puzzle were in place. The New York Islanders had made the long trip from expansion doormats to the NHL's elite. The team would capture the regular season points title in 78 and 79. Yet despite their regular season success, the team suffered disappointments in the playoffs. In 1978, they were manhandled by a tough Toronto Maple Leaf team. A year later, they would be stunned by the New York Rangers, who rolled hot goaltender John Davidson to an upset victory. It's sometimes it's as easy to win as it is to lose. And if you have that kind of mentality, then it just kind of snowballs and if you're the type of team that you're going into the last period and you've been losing all the time well you, you sit back and you wait for something to happen and when something happens and you say well geez I told we knew it was going to happen you know and, and if you sit back like that it does happen to you and I think we sat back a little bit in those two years and uh, and we got burnt because of it rumors of the Islanders being broken up abounded as did questions regarding the team's collective heart. However, the New York Islanders would learn from these two crushing defeats and would soon answer the critics. Our team was very young. You know, we got there very quickly and they expected overnight things. Well, it doesn't happen overnight. You have to find out what it is to get knocked down and you have to get up again and fight again to get there. And uh, every time it gets tougher and tougher. So they had to learn that and, and uh, they learned their lesson very well. The people were up there standing and cheering and warm. I mean, I had chills going down my back. But <laughs> The people were up there standing and cheering and warm. I mean, I had chills going down my back. The 1979 playoff defeat at the hands of the hated New York Rangers had cast a pall over the island. The team that seemed destined to capture a cup was now in danger of being broken up. The Islanders began the 1979-80 season slowly, but managed to reach the 500 mark at the midway point of the 80-game campaign. Torrey, however, didn't overhaul the team. Rather, he continued to tweak his product. The Islanders obtained defenseman Ken Morrow, fresh off his Olympic gold medal winning performance in Lake Placid, and then traded for Butch Goring, a player that many felt was the final piece of the Islanders' puzzle. The addition of Butch Goring uh, was a dramatic turn for our team, only because he was, if you, if you looked at our team as a puzzle on the whole, we were missing that one, puzzle, one piece of the puzzle, and that was Butch, because Butch created uh, a very strong uh, another line. I mean, we had, we had three good lines, uh, but with Butch, he created four. And I'm, and I'm talking, every one of our lines, one through four, were able to go out in the ice and, and be, be a force on the ice. Well, bringing in Butch was, you know, something that we truly, truly needed. Uh, he added, you know, a few different dimensions to the team. First, uh, uh, just an incredible penalty killer. And secondly, very calm, very cool, and just really kind of fit right in with the team. The Islanders finished the regular season undefeated in their final 12 games. They defeated the Los Angeles Kings in the first round of the playoffs to advance against the tough Boston Bruins in the quarterfinals. 
Boston's rugged style was similar to that of the Toronto Maple Leafs, who two years earlier had eliminated the Islanders with their intimidating style of play. The Islanders had learned a valuable lesson from that Toronto series, as the Bruins would soon find out. Clark Gillies went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Boston tough man Terry O'Reilly on three separate occasions in the series. The Islanders had proved they could stand up to the Bruins and won the series four games to one. Those things that happened in the first, in the first period of that second game probably brought our team closer together uh, than any, any event that had inter, ever happened in our history because we, we finally did what it took to stand up against these teams to really show them that you know, you can play any way you want against us, and it's not going to work. If you want to skate, pass, shoot, we can play that way. If you want to drop the gloves and you want to fight all night, that's fine with us too, because we had, we had the talent that could stand up and fight. Cup semifinals, the Isles defeated the Buffalo Sabres four games to two. The New York Islanders were now poised for their first ever Stanley Cup. I think our team was very confident, but I know in the back of their mind, they're thinking, you know, this is, this is another chance that we have, and we can't let this slip like we have the other chances. And they were very determined, and, and they were prepared. Whatever was going to be thrown at them, they were going to react the right way. won their first ever cup final game at the Spectrum in Philadelphia on a Dennis Potvin overtime goal. The Flyers, winners of 48 regular season games, rebounded, trouncing the Islanders 8-3 in game two. The Islanders captured games three and four in the first ever Stanley Cup final games to be played on the island. The series then moved back to Philadelphia for game five, where the Flyers would win 6-3, closing the gap to three games to two. May 24, 1980, game six moves back to the island as a jubilant home crowd packs the Coliseum in hopes of seeing the coronation of their beloved Islanders. The people were just going crazy. They were all outside when we come in, and, and uh, uh, there's a lot of tension in the air. Long Island crowd, they've always been great. But that day, I mean, they were going crazy. I could have cried in warm-up. <laughs> no, it, it was so interesting because they had given such an ovation in Philadelphia. And I guess there had been word spread around, you know, let's not let Philly outdo us. And the people were up there standing and cheering and warm. I mean, I chills going down my back. The Flyers jumped out to an early 1-0 lead, but the Islanders came right back, evening the score on a Dennis Potvin goal, then taking the lead on a disputed score by Dwayne Sutter. By the end of the second period, the Isles have built a 4-2 lead. They stand just 20 minutes from raising the cup as they enter the locker room. We were high-fiving, we were celebrating, we were happy. I mean, all the guys were, yeah, we did. And it turned around so quickly that it was incredible. The Flyers scored twice in the third period to even the score at four apiece. The Islanders and the Flyers would go to sudden death overtime. When we came back in after the third period, it was like depression, manic depression. And then all of a sudden, we always had a thing in the locker room. Someone would yell out, who's going to be the hero? And then it would go down the line, I am, I am, I am, I am. With approximately seven minutes having elapsed in overtime, the line of John Tonelli, Bob Nystrom, and Lauren Henning hit the ice. Just seeing 
there was that lapse on the Flyers' part where they sent the puck down deep inside our blue line, and they were changing. They cleared the puck out of the zone, and Lauren was kind of back and intercepted the pass. Right away, we turned it up ice. Johnny and I both swung out, and he turned the pass over to Nelly, and we were going down on Bob Daly and Moose DuPont. Bobby and I had been working on these crisscrosses and practices all year, and it was a perfect scenario for us to crisscross. And so when Johnny came over with the puck towards my side, I, I crossed in behind him, and he got uh, Bob Daly to just bite a little bit. And Bobby was wide open going to the net. And Johnny was going in wide on, on DuPont, kind of just pulled back like this and fired a pass right to me on my stick. And even though it was a hard pass, it seemed like I thought of about 12 things that I wanted to do with the puck. And then I said to myself, who are you kidding? I said, you better just deflect it. Pass right on the stick of Tonelli. Coming in with Nystrom. Tonelli to Nystrom. He scores! Bob Nystrom scores the goal. The Islanders win the Stanley Cup. When Bobby Nystrom scored the goal, I wasn't really sure if the puck went in the net. You know, there was a little, there was a slight pause there. Is it in or isn't it in? And, uh, and then when we realized that it was in, uh, it was just that, uh, you know, a feeling of, of, uh, of pride anyway. And because, and everything goes through your head so, uh, you know, so quickly. And the hapless Islanders and everything we'd been called, you know, the chokers, they can't win the big games when it counts, they choke and this and that. And I, I, I was very, very proud of the, of the team, uh, the whole team, of the way they reacted to everything. And, and uh, uh, they came to play and they came to win. And uh, I was proud in each and every one of them. Eight years, 11 months, and 16 days after the franchise's inception, the New York Islanders were Stanley Cup champions. In the 1970s, Bill Torrey built the Islanders with careful selection in the draft. Those picks would eventually turn into the tremendously talented core group of the New York Islanders. Look at the work of this Islander team! Gotcha. Absolutely uh, an inspiration to me. He gave of his body, he hit, he back-checked. Best power centerman in the National League for all the years he played for us. Tough when he had to be, and 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 tough offensively when he had to be. I don't think that anybody can say a bad word against Clark Gilly. He's just a, a great person and a great player. It didn't take you long. I mean, if the first time he stepped on the ice and got the puck, you knew that this kid was, was pretty special. Skating behind him, watching him shoot the puck in a game situation, and saying to myself, he can't put it there. And next thing you know, it's right there. Score! Nice dribbles right on top I'll of I'll tell you, when he come to the rink, uh, he come to play. And he had a, a big impact on our, on our hockey club. And, you know, if there's one player you're going to call Mr. Islander, I think it's Bob Nystrom. He didn't talk to Smitty. I didn't anyway. Once he got to the, when he came into the locker room, he'd sit down, he'd put his pads on, he'd sit there for an hour and just stare, you know. And I would make a point not to say anything to Smitty. This is my own way of dealing with Smitty. I, I would not go near him. I would not make eye contact with him. Best playoff goaltender ever, uh, without a doubt in my mind. Um, probably the most unpleasant guy I've ever met on a playoff to the day, you know what I mean? He did his own thing, came in before the game, took his two glasses of Coke, 
and then just laid back in his stall. He was pretty sharp, and I'll tell you, he's a great competitor, and he put some money down where Billy, when he played the game, there was nobody better. Danny was a, a tremendous player. Um, you know, maybe a little bit more, uh, I would say a little tougher than anyone thought, but uh, as far as talent, there's not too many around him. A great, great hockey player, um, deservedly so in the Hockey Hall of Fame, and, and just a real, uh, a real leader, real solid, uh, uh, well-spoken, you know, at the right time, new one, new one to push buttons. Denny has a, a, a tremendous ego. Uh, I think that's what made him such a great player, is that he took such great pride in his ability. The only thing I ever wanted from Denny was to back up everything he said, and he did. Islanders would not be content with just one cup. The core of the team was intact and the sky was the limit as they entered the early 1980s. I think once you win the Stanley Cup, it's a feeling that you never want to let go. And uh, boy, we had passed our test and uh, we just didn't, did not want to let that feeling go away. The Isles would quench their thirst for victory again in 1981. Cup number two would come in a five-game victory over the Minnesota North Stars at the Nassau Coliseum. The budding dynasty was in serious jeopardy the following year. The team trailed the Pittsburgh Penguins 3-1 with a little over five minutes remaining in the deciding fifth game of their first round playoff series. Just won two Stanley Cups. The second one very easily and looking at this team that should, shouldn't even come close to beating us, and we're going, this is not how it's supposed to end, boys. This is not how it's supposed to end. I'm sitting in the penalty box, and the scorekeeper says to me, he says, I can't believe it's over. And I, I said, you know what? It's not over yet. It wasn't over. Mike McEwen scored for New York to close the gap to 3-2. to two. Lady Luck then shined on the Islanders as hard-working John Tanelli pounced on a loose puck and knocked home the tying goal. Center, a long shot wide of the net. Tanelli in after it. Off the stick of Carl Alton, and he scores! John Tanelli has tied the game! Through the years, the Isles had enjoyed tremendous success in the pressure of sudden death overtime. They would need to do it again if the dynasty was to continue. A lot of teams go in overtime and they're nervous and apprehensive and, and they sit back and wait for something to happen. I says, you know, our motto, we're not sitting back and waiting. Uh, you know, if the odds are in our favor, uh, you don't do something stupid where it's 70-30 against you. If it's 50-50, we go for it. And we're going for a full blast. In the cup final, the Islanders would meet the Vancouver Canucks, who they would defeat in four straight games. As the final seconds ticked away, the Islanders had permanently removed the word hapless from any descriptions of their franchise and replaced it with the word dynasty. The Islanders win the Stanley Cup in a sweep, their third consecutive Stanley Cup. The Institute of Culinary Education has been an eye-opener for me. The instructors at the Institute are amazing. It's five minutes away from Union Square. You have the farmer's market. You're surrounded by so many restaurants. I'd spent a lot of time looking at other schools. This was the place I felt most comfortable. From chef, baker, or restaurant owner to caterer or cookbook author, we've been training people to do what they love for 25 years. We offer job placement, small class sizes, and flexible schedules. The Institute of Culinary Education. Call now for a personal tour. So, Doctor, hmm? you've been studying the effects of Red Bull for months. What exactly have you discovered? In the 
Technology boundaries and biorhythmic fluctuations can make it difficult to maintain a baseline rating of muscular contraction and low transmissible input of course, you need the oxyribonuclear acidity and orbital phase of gravitational fluctuations can indeed result in a fibromyalgic red bull type of situational relevance as well. But we've calibrated the amount of available regenerative uh, tolerances. Can you say that in English? Simple little man. Red bull gives you wings. The best I ever had. What makes the Nissan Pathfinder the envy of all SUVs? The number one selling import SUV in the Northeast. A five-star crash test rating. 240 horsepower. Hey, if you were an SUV, you'd be jealous too. And now, get low 3.9 APR for 60 months or 1,000 cash back on a new Pathfinder. Offers end January 31st. Nissan. Driven. The Metro TV. Despite winning three straight Stanley Cups, the Islanders entered the 1983 Cup Finals as underdogs to the young Edmonton Oilers of Mark Messier, Paul Coffey, and Wayne Gretzky. Yet the experience of the Isles would prove to be too much for the high-flying Oilers. When New York's Ken Morrow netted an open net goal with a little over a minute remaining in Game 4, it signaled the celebration of a fourth straight Stanley Cup title and the Islanders' second straight sweep in the Cup Finals. The Islanders' drive for a fifth straight Cup would be halted by the same Edmonton Oilers team that they had defeated in 1983. The run of consecutive Stanley Cup championships had come to an end. Yet what the New York Islanders had accomplished from 1980 through 1983 had put them in a special place in the world of sports. They had become a dynasty. Looking back and, and knowing that you gave your best to accomplish what you wanted to do. And in my mind, there's no one can take my rings away, no one can take my championships away, uh, because I'll have those for the rest of my life. I think we're we're all focused uh, at doing our, our own jobs well. It's just a, a team of a bunch of different hockey players that, that came together as a cohesive group to put ourselves in that Stanley Cup four times. I, uh, I can't say it any better than that. It was a wonderful organization because we grew every year. We got better, and there's nothing better than that. Our expectations were high every year. We got better every year. We earned the respect that every athlete wants to have. That's what we're out there for. You know, earn the respect, you know, first from your teammates and then from your opponents. And I think we did that as a whole. I think we really had probably the best hockey team uh, that was ever assembled. And, you know, people in Montreal are going to obviously argue that point. But uh, if you want to you know, usually these things are determined by statistics, and it, just look at the statistics. We accomplished more than anybody else has ever accomplished. Canelli to Nystrom, he scores! The Islanders win the Stanley Cup! He scores! Mike Coffey has his 50th goal! What the New York Islanders accomplished from 1980 through 1983 was one of the greatest feats in sports history. 
their four straight Stanley Cup championships have placed them in select company in the world of sports. They are a true dynasty, and in New York, they are legendary. For Metro Sports Legends, I'm Fran Healy. Need a good laugh? Then check out Metro TV next at 10 for new stand-up comedy from the Gotham Comedy Club on New Joke City. At 10.30 on Subway Q&A, Rich Collier rounds up a couple of tough new big brothers to protect one strap hanger from 